advocating for workplace suicide prevention. The man on the left is Juan V. Hill. And I met Juan V. Hill in the summer of 2013. It was just a few months after he had lost his beloved captain, Captain Steve Magana, and a certain part of the Denver Fire Department uh, got fire in their belly to try to find solutions so that suicide would not impact their department um, in the way that the captains had. And so Juan came to me with his coworkers and they said, Sally, would you please help us? And I said, listen, guys, it was all guys. Uh, you've known about warning signs and risk factors for suicide for a very long time. You've learned about it in the academy. Um, you regularly help the community with these things. There's nothing I can teach you there. Uh, what you don't have are stories. You don't have people within the department saying, yes, I have fought through my own suicidal experiences and I've come uh, through it and I've learned some things. You don't have people sharing openly that they've gone to reach out for counseling or other types of behavioral health support. And because you don't have these stories, people don't believe it's true, um, that it can happen and that it, and people can recover. And so over the next uh, subsequent 18 months, I got to know the Denver Fire Department fairly well. We had a lot of listening sessions. We talked about these things from focus groups and interviews and through surveys. And when we came out the other side, I said, I need a few storytellers to help shift the culture of this department. And they looked at me and they said, Sally, that's the scariest thing anyone has ever asked us to do. Now, remember, these men and women run into burning buildings, uh, but sharing a vulnerable story about their mental health or suicide or addiction was something that was very, very intimidating to them. Um, but one by one, they all raised their hand in, my, in the small group that I was working with most closely, including Juan. And on the day that we were filming, um, after much coaching around storytelling, we were filming a training video for the department and asking a number of the members from firefighters all the way up to the chief uh, to share stories. He said, I'm doing this because I believe it's the right thing to do, but I'm, I'm very nervous. And he said, I need you to promise me one thing. This is in the hallway outside the video studio. He said, promise me that when we go to the training, you'll edit my tears out of this video. And I said, absolutely, Juan. I will edit in any way that makes you feel comfortable. Um, so more on Juan um, and his evolution through this process over the last seven years. Um, the other man in this slide is uh, John Kinning. John is the COO and executive vice president of a large contracting construction company here in the Denver, Denver area. Um, he and his brother run the business uh, and he and I were serving um, together as part of Leadership Denver back in 2013, 2014. And when you're part of these leadership networking groups, you go out for coffee. So John and I are out for coffee one morning and he says to me, he says, Sally, you know, when you talk about who's at risk for suicide, you're talking about my folks, uh, all the risk factors we have on my workforce. And I don't want to wait for a tragedy to happen. Show me, what do we need to do here to get in front of this? And so we started this full systematic and comprehensive approach to suicide prevention with his company. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole enchilada that I'll be rolling out today in, in bits and pieces for you. We're about three months in. It's a, it's a needs and strengths assessment. It's leadership coaching. It's training, a communication strategy, a policy and resource audit, all of these things. We're about three months in and he says, Sally, we have unlo un unleashed something here that I didn't even know was an issue. We have so many people who are in pain, we have so many people who are worried about family members and our employee assistance program is completely dysfunctional. And I had no idea that this was happening. He said, what, what we've done here um, needs to be well beyond the scope of just my company. We need to take this national. And so his company underwrote the development of the of our nation's first construction industry blueprint for suicide prevention. Now, Granted, back in 2013, 2014, when we were doing the work with both of these companies or organizations, we didn't have really great data that showed that either, um, well, especially construction was at higher risk for suicide, but we had enough stories to know that there was an issue there. Um, and launching those guidelines really helped galvanize a lot of energy around this topic. So more on these men and their leadership and the impact that they've had on workplace suicide prevention to come soon. Um, one of the things that I'm very privileged to do is travel internationally 
to learn about what other countries are doing around suicide prevention. And this has opened my eyes to a lot of things, especially on workplace suicide prevention, because countries like Canada and New Zealand and Australia and in some parts of the UK, um, they're pretty far down the path ahead of us. And so we can learn a lot. Uh, but one of the things they also taught me um, that I started to do many years ago was this acknowledgement of country, um, acknowledging indigenous people. And so I'd like to do that now. I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respect to the people whose land we're gathered on today. And today calling in from Connor for Colorado, the original custodians of this land were the Ute people. I pay respect to their elders in the past, but they have laid the foundation for us to walk and the elders of today who carry stories forward of traditions and wisdom. I'd also like to acknowledge any First Nation, Indigenous, Aboriginal, or Native people on our webinar today. We as non-Indigenous people have much to learn from the oldest living cultures on earth. And while that's an important thing to do, as we know, uh, it is also very critical to the conversation of suicide prevention as Native communities all around the world have some of the highest rates of suicide anywhere. I'd like to acknowledge all people with lived experience on this call, whether you're a loss survivor, attempt survivor, thought survivor, or support person, your voice matters in the work of workplace suicide prevention and suicide prevention more broadly. Again, I'm very grateful for uh, Center Stone for leading this effort and inviting me to speak on workplace suicide prevention and for all of you doing important work in this space. Um, because this issue touches a lot of people personally, um, I know that it's being recorded. So if you feel like today is not the day for you to be thinking about or having memories or feelings about this, um, you can come back and get it another time. Um, I am, as uh, was mentioned, kind of a social media person. I really do engage quite a bit with the different platforms. We just had our largest Twitter chat ever um, last week, uh, Elevate the Convo. We invited all of the national players into the arena to have a Twitter chat within an hour, and we had 70 million impressions, which just is mind boggling. Um, so if you wanna join us, we have monthly Twitter chats on all kinds of topics. Many of them are related to workplace suicide prevention. I also have a TED Talk, again, about the power of storytelling in suicide prevention. And then I also have a podcast that I call Hope Illuminated, and I do interview a number of thought leaders in the space of workplace suicide prevention. So please connect with me on whatever platform you use. I'd love to hear more about your interest in this topic and learn from you. So my goals for today are really to talk about this moment in time we have about, sorry, about this perfect storm of stress that we're experiencing and how that shows up in the workplace. And then the bulk of my time today, we'll be talking about the National Guidelines for Workplace Suicide Prevention. Uh, so I don't need to tell all of you, we have a lot of stressors coming that um, not only have been driven by, by the pandemic, but also the social unrest the election, the economy, number of students went back to school this morning, Zoom died on us. Like we've got a lot of things happening that is driving uncertainty, isolation, anxiety, and disruption. And you better believe that that is hitting our workplaces really hard. We have some early indicators that people's mental health is suffering. We have in, uh, evidence of increased alcohol use, domestic violence, firearm purchases, um, the child welfare calls are actually going down since people have been uh, sheltering at home um, and, and not going to school because that's usually where uh, abused and neglected children are discovered and reported. Um, and of course, the unemployment fluctuations are also pretty disastrous for people. So will this increase suicide rates? We don't know. If we're honest, um, we have all these perfect storm indicators and Early, uh, early indicators, but we also know that sometimes during crises, people pull together um, and they have silver lining experiences that buffer them against the tragedy of suicide. So we're gathering data as quickly as we can, we, we can figure it out. But I can tell you, leaders everywhere are wanting some handholds on how to navigate, uh, especially in the workplace, what they can do to help workers feel connected and secure um, and purposeful. And so one of our mantras through this crisis has been these three things. Do we know what's gonna happen in six months? We don't, but we can predict that tomorrow at eight o'clock, we're gonna have a briefing. So one of the things that happens in crises is that people lose a sense of predictability. The uncertainty is very wearing on people's well-being. They lose all kinds of um, security that they're going to be safe or that their family's going to be safe um, and that they actually have some control over their lives. So the, as much as workplace leaders can add to predictability, psychological safety and control, um, they will start having that reassuring experience with their workforce. 
So predictability is you can say, yes, we predict that tomorrow we will be having a meeting to talk about our procedures around this, that, and the other thing. Um, with psychological safety, making sure even more so that toxic stress point, pain points are reduced or mitigated against and that people's sense of um, not being humiliated or embarrassed and so forth is taken into consideration. And then control, just giving people as much choice as possible um, in areas where you can offer choice. Um, another piece that has come up since COVID uh, within workplace mental health and suicide prevention, as a number of workplaces have been trying to pivot quickly to help their workers, um, is this program that we developed back in March that's now been rolled out in upwards of, I don't know, almost uh, over a dozen companies, most of them fairly large, is this uh, coping, uh, coping cards project or toolbox talks, depending on what kind of industry you're in. Um, we're helping uh, leaders with talking points and then doing uh, pulse checks on their workforce from every month to every two months. How's it going out there? Is it better than it was before? Is it worse? What's helping? What's harming? What do you need? Um, and those little pulse check surveys are then helping us pivot quickly to the psychological needs of their workforce. And we drop out these co coping cards um, about three a week that are very brief and action oriented um, to help yourself or to help someone else in your life. And, and these have gotten quite a bit of traction. Uh, within different industries and across different size workforces. So that's been kind of uh, a, 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 an, an important way to serve right now. Um, why am I here? Well, this is why I'm here. Uh, for a very long period of time, um, I got called to this work, uh, as was indicated in the introduction, because my brother died by suicide. And when we started our work in this area, we wanted to do bold gap-filling efforts. And what we realized is that many people... Um, who were dying by suicide had never reached out to any form of mental health support, but they were working. Uh, most of them were working or they had just been working and they, or they had a family member that was working. So workplaces are probably the most broad system that we have to intervene when people are experiencing suicidal thoughts, even more than healthcare. So that is why we started this work. And so in 2007, um, we, we launched a program called Work Minds, which was the nation's first workplace suicide specific training. And it was a slow go. We would be knocking on all kinds of employers and professional associations doors saying, mm -hmm. this is so important. You can make a difference and alleviate suffering and saving lives. And they would say, no, that's a medical issue that needs to be taken up with doctors and professionals. And we would say, but but people aren't reaching out to doctors and professionals, but they're coming to work. You could make a difference. Well, it didn't matter how much we begged and pleaded. It, we couldn't get across until these uh, reports started coming out from the CDC. The first report coming out in 2016, second in 2018, and the third coming out in 2020, just this January, um, that ranked industries by suicide rates. Now, as many of you, of you know, suicide death is predominantly by working aged men. So the industries that have the highest rates of suicide death are male dominated industries. That's no surprise. Now in this chart, we've, we've pulled apart the men from the women because if you mix them together, the women's data just gets lost. Um, but these are the industries that are coming forward first. Male dominated industries like oil and gas, mining extraction, construction has pretty much dominated the, the the leading space of working on suicide pre prevention specifically. That other services category is, like it says, it's a hodgepodge of other services, but it's things like automobile services and personal services like barbers and so forth, um, agriculture, forestry, fishing, transportation, both the train and air, um, air industries have come forward and so forth. So this data legit legitimized our efforts in suicide prevention in the workplace and has been a game changer in, in engaging the conversations, especially in those industries. Um, I will also say that since they have come forward and blazed a path, we're also now seeing some other industries that have a better gender balance, including um, healthcare and um, also the service industry and the entertainment industry um, and, and all of those, as we can appreciate, have been um, extraordinarily impacted by the pandemic. Um, this is another uh, way that people have been coming into the conversation about workplace suicide prevention is really positioning it as a health and safety issue. Um, for those of you who've experienced your own experiences with mental health, um, significant mental health challenges or suicidal thoughts and behavior, 
um, as I have in the spring of 2012, you know um, it can be very overwhelming. Uh, and often the first thing to go is disrupted sleep. Either you can't sleep or you can't seem to wake up. Um, and that's a real um, issue if you're in a position of working where you're in charge of heavy machinery or um, very quick decision making and so forth. And so be, being able to get in front of this by giving people an opportunity to safely navigate supports and get themselves back on their feet is a really important piece of this um, because fatigue, distraction, Impaired judgment are often um, huge safety concerns uh, and all the training in the world on how to use a harness or how to navigate a ladder are not going to impact as well as if people are emotionally well when they come to work. And so we must be giving people the opportunity to get themselves back on their feet. Uh, um, many of you are familiar with Thomas Joyner's model. This has also resonated very heavily with workplace conversations about suicide prevention. So for those of you who are, are familiar, you know that he has a much more complicated model than this, um, but this is the simplified version that is easily transferable um, and descriptive to uh, non-clinical people, which is one of the reasons why I really appreciate it. It doesn't explain all things about suicide, but it does really help open up the conversation in a non-clinical way. Um, so the idea of being a burden and how that translates to the workplace is part of the conversation that we have when people have been invested or when people are not able to keep up with technology or have been furloughed. All of these are ways that people can start to feel like they're a burden as driven by their workplace. Um, similarly, with um, thwarted belongingness, this idea that I used to belong, I used to matter here, and now I don't. This happens sometimes with discrimination and hazing and harassment uh, and all kinds of other workplace stressors and strains. And then in terms of capability, what Thomas has argued in his model is that there's certain ways that people have increased fearlessness around death that increases their um, risk taking around suicide. And so a lot of the industries that I mentioned really attract risk takers, right? First responders, construction, uh, people, who are, um, people who are able to do things that are very daunting and fearful for many of us. So you can start to see again, this perfect storm of uh, the, the I want to and how that's related to workplace stress and the I can and how that's related to specific industries or specific types of workers um, that we see these increased rates. Uh, and then, of course, where the overlap is where we have the high risk for death. All right. So moving on, my main point of conversation today is very exciting. It's the National Guidelines for Workplace Suicide Prevention. And this is a screenshot of the homepage of the website. So one of the homework assignments for all of you is to, to go to Workplace Suicide Prevention and go check it out. I'm going to kind of walk you through how we got here um, and what to expect when you get there. But um, getting a number of workplaces enrolled in the national guidelines is our goal. When we think about suicide prevention, many people automatically think of the downstream efforts of suicide prevention, right? For the people who are in the throes of crisis or in the aftermath of a suicide death or an attempt. And yes, we absolutely need to be focused on that and show up with our best game to help people through those very, very difficult times. But truly, the only way to get in front of suicide is to do more upstream work. Um, at the midstream, we're trying to catch things early uh, and as things are emerging and things are percolating um, and triage people to a buffet of resources, not just one, but many, uh, because not everything fits for everybody. And then upstream for that, how do we build protective factors? How do we reduce the social determinants for suicide? Um, and how do we help inoculate um, populations or transitions within the workplace that might increase suicide risk? So knowing this framework, upstream, midstream, downstream, led us to uh, where we headed in the guidelines. The guidelines were developed as a three-legged stool partnership between the American Association of Suicidology. For those of you who are interested, we have a workplace prevention and postvention committee that meets monthly to discuss the guidelines and to continually evolve them. That's another key important point about the guidelines. It's not a static document that gets outdated in three years. It's a continually um, evolving 
set of practices. Um, so uh, please join us over there at the Workplace Committee of the American Association of Suicidology. Um, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention has also been a key partner. Um, they helped underwrite this effort and have offered all kinds of resources to support it, including personnel. Um, and then United Suicide Survivors International is the third nonprofit partner. Um, we are about bringing the voices of lived experience into the development and the evaluation of the guidelines. So while in our research and development phase, we had all kinds of focus groups and interviews and surveys with people that you would expect, employee assistance programs, HR professionals, uh, formal peer support in workplaces, health and safety professionals. We also had people who had lived through their suicide crisis while they were working, not necessarily at the workplace, but they were employed when it happened. Again, whether that was a near miss or an attempt or a death. And they got to have equal footing at the table when we said, what's working, what's not working, and what can we do better? And I think you'll see that lived experience voice threaded throughout the development of the guidelines. Um, these are eight guiding principles that really are the core values of the national guidelines. Number one, it needs to be strategic. It can't just be a one-off training or a one-off uh, awareness day. Um, tied with the second uh, top principle, it needs to be strategically attached to the goals and the mission and the vision of the organization. Um, and it needs to be sustained over time. It needs to show up several times, ideas of upstream, midstream, and downstream suicide prevention several times over the course of a person's career um, or as they're coming into different parts of the industry. Um, we're focused on harm reduction, and by that I mean looking at those social determinants of suicide and trying to mitigate some of that toxicity. So it's not good enough just to make sure all the troubled workers get to counselors. We also need to look at what workplaces are doing to increase risk and mitigate those harms. Um, we need to create a culture, and this is often driven by leadership, on caring and looking out for one another and reassurance. We need to make sure that people's dignity is protected um, as they experience hardship, uh, and that's through uh, privacy as well as um, listening to their voice uh, and empowering them to manage their own problems and giving them the tools and handholds when needed. It's not good enough just to get people back from the brink of suicidal despair either. Workplaces also have a role in promoting well-being um, throughout this process. The empowered connection value is that we really need to know our resources intimately. We need to be able to say, yes, I know this person from our EAP, Dr. Jane, she's amazing, um, and really do that warm handoff because people in the workforce understand and know their resources very well. And then finally, it's not just good enough to have awareness raising at a workplace, you need to um, embolden people to take action, action through policy changes, action through, um, uh, skill development and so forth. So these are the guiding principles that weave through the nine practices um, of suicide prevention in the workplace. Now, usually this is a full day training for me, so I'm just going to highlight a few as we go through them. But as you can see, upstream is the top uh, row, uh, midstream is the middle row, and downstream is the, the bottom row. And when you get to the website, workplacesuicideprevention.com, you'll see little brief tutorials on each of these and then you will be enrolled into engage into some action steps around each of these. So let me just kind of walk you through a few of them so you can get the gist. Again, remember, upstream is about promoting protective factors, eliminating um, the hazards, the job hazards that are driving despair, uh, and really focus on framing communication in a way that makes suicide prevention accessible and effective. So at the heart of many, much of this is leadership. Now, going back to my story, um, one of the things that I value about both, uh, both Juan and John is that they were bold. They stepped into the arena knowing that potentially there would be backlash. You know, you're a firefighter. You talk about your intense emotional experiences. That's a, it's a hard place to be a leader in. Same with construction. It's so competitive. Um, that you don't want to have anything in the public that p people could potentially look at you as anything less than excellent. Um, but both of these men realized that their leadership mattered greatly and that they've had the experience of other people following in behind them. 
They also both positioned this as a health and safety priority that got baked in to all kinds of other health and safety priorities at their workplace. They looked at their policies and they looked at their resources. As I mentioned, um, one of the things John Kinning realized when he started poking around his employee assistance program is that the services that he had signed up for were incredibly limited. They did not mesh with their healthcare plans and that people were dropping out before they even got the benefit of it. Um, they both were able to also champion reassurance from the top. Uh, Juan got the attention of his chief about this issue and the chief came out and said very publicly um, that he too had been overwhelmed at one point of his life and that he reached out for support and it helped make him a better leader. Uh, he also said, so if any of you, my firefighting family, experience hardship in this way, I want you to come directly to me because I've got your back. This is a very key thing for a leader to say. I've got your back and I will persist with you until we figure out this together. Uh, so messages of reassurance, messages of similar experiences. Um, if I've got a leader who's willing to tell their story of coming through a hard time and reaching out for support, most of the work of culture change is, got, is done. They all have such an impact with that if it's an effective story. And then as soon as you see that, you'll start to see all kinds of cool things happening. Um, first of all, everybody who looks up to that leader and what they're recognizing and rewarding and modeling starts to shape the hierarchical influence. But not soon after, you'll start to see peers. And that's exactly what we saw with the Denver Fire Department and RK. Other similar departments and companies started peering around the corner and saying, what are they doing over there? Suicide prevention, for real, is that a thing? Oh, maybe we should be doing it too. And they became models uh, for many other groups, well beyond even their industry. So the other part of the upstream is again, mitigating those hazards that workplace can, can perpetrate on their workers. This is an overwhelming slide by design. I wanted to show you all of the workplace uh, toxic hazards that are connected in the literature to increased suicidal thoughts, attempts, or death. All of these. Um, and you can see they kind of organize around a couple of different buckets. We've got a bunch of job design issues like job autonomy and variety, uh, the effort reward imbalance, and so forth. We've got a bunch of um, toxic things like bullying, harassment, hazing, discrimination, and trauma. Uh, we have a culture of um, poor self-care that may increase substance use as part of the workplace culture, all kinds of things related to family and work spilling over into one another, and you get the idea. Now, here's an important thing to consider. Um, many of our male-dominated workforces, because they involve you know, pretty intense types of risk-taking work, um, have been focused on safety for a very long time. And this is a framework that they are familiar with. It's NIOSH's hierarchy of controls. And what NIOSH recommended is that, yes, it's important at the individual level to make sure, in the analogy of other types of hazards, that people are wearing what they call the PPE, the personal protective equipment. So that would be like hard hats and reflective gear and so forth, right? So they said that it's very important that people take care of their individual safety, but you know what's really gonna help even more is if the environment has eliminated as many of those hazards as possible. So if we translate this hierarchy of controls out of the realm of things falling or tripping or um, you know, machine malfunction and so forth into the world of psychological safety, you can also see here the argument that yes, it's really important to help people get to the things that can help them get back on their feet like peer support or their employee assistance program. But if we're only addressing this one individual at a time, um, we're not gonna be as effective as if we are when we look at the top of the pyramid and start to eliminate or mitigate some of the psychosocial hazards that are at work. Now, there's been a lot of workplace mental health programs, but they almost all focus on um, you know, understanding things like depression and anxiety and addiction and trauma um, at the individual level and much less so on the social determinants or the workplace determinants of despair and distress. All right, that's all I'm going to say about upstream. Midstream, we're going to try to catch things early as they're emerging, as I say, when first thought comes onto the radar um, and really helping empower people to find within a buffet of resources what's the best fit for them. Uh, so this involves things like what we call self-care orientation that is about helping people develop their own crisis response plan, helping them do um, 
anonymous and confidential self-screening so they can determine for themselves, how bad is it? Do I need support? Um, offering a stratified training program that, again, drops into people's career at different pl places, and then really considering developing an advanced peer network. All right, let me just highlight a couple of these. Um, this is a slide that comes from my uh, dear colleague. She's a retired judge. Her specialty in law was HR and mental health. Um, and she's been a tremendous partner in this effort. She also serves on our committee for the American Association of Suicidology. She said what she, what she saw from her bench over and over and over again was this, what she called the silent suicidal spiral. So for many reasons, an employee who's suffering is not reaching out, not getting treatment, not disclosing. There's lots of good reasons why people don't tell us that they're hurting or that they need support. And it's not surprising then that their performance ends up taking a hit. If you're not sleeping, if you're very distracted by concern about other family members or um, having an addiction, you're, you're, it's eventually going to show up in your performance. Uh, so somebody gets reported and they go see a supervisor or an HR person um, and all that they're focused on is the performance. They're not, they're not doing what they used to do. And so the usual tool when that happens is a performance management tool, which I don't know if any of you have ever been under one of those, but it's absolutely no fun. Um, you feel like you're micromanaged and that everybody's second guessing all your decisions. This drives divisiveness in a workplace and increases strain, um, really erodes any sense of trust that the person had with their supervisor or with HR. Um, so again, it's not uncommon that at some point in that experience, um, it just becomes too much and suicide comes on the menu. Now, because there's not a good relationship there with the supervisor or HR person, the options then are very limited because the strain in the relationship is so great. So accommodations are not really explored or taken advantage of, and it sometimes results in litigation uh, because the employee does not feel like the workplace had their best interest at heart. Now, what can we do to improve this? we can train our managers to approach it differently. Same start, employee doesn't get treatment, they're suffering, performance declines, they show up in HR, somebody's reported on them that their performance is declining. This time, however, the manager or HR, whoever is the point person, understands that when somebody's performance suddenly declines, there's usually something else going on. Now, you talk to HR about this, they're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, we got, we got ADA, we got HIPAA, we've got all these legal issues, and Judge McClatchy says, calm down, take a breath. You can totally navigate this without fear of any of those legal issues coming into play. What you do is you say, you know what, sometimes when people are not performing as they were, there's something else going on in their life. I don't know if that's true or not of you. Um, if it is, I want you to know that I've got your back. You don't need to tell me, but if it is something that's true for you, I have resources to help you and I'm here for you to help you navigate that. That sense of communication that is supportive and partnering and collaborative strengthens that relationship. Then we can mobilize those resources, whether that's the employee assistance program or some kind of buddy system. The trust is strengthened and there's a lot more option on the table. You know, it turns out when workplaces are experienced as taking care of and caring about that person, uh, litigation is much less likely to happen. Um, sometimes because things like depression and addiction are pretty insidious, we got to go around the bend a couple of times and that's also okay and something to be expected of, uh, same as you would do with reoccurring cancer. All right, now another mid midstream um, part of the, the guidelines is this idea of stratified training program. And again, when I'm talking to these uh, mostly safety conscious industries, I use the analogy of CPR. We all understand how the CPR system works. We get trained, it's very basic. We get trained multiple times, there's practice involved. Um, and we understand that should there be someone who has stopped breathing or is choking or drowning or having some kind of heart issue where they need some support, that we're not the ones that are gonna do surgery on them, but we're the ones that are gonna keep them alive until we can bring in the, the, the next level player to do the more intensive intervention. And we all get that. Now we also understand that people are trained more than once because if you don't use it, it doesn't be, stay fresh. We also understand that a lot of people can be trained and not everybody's gonna be able to do it. That's why we retrain people and train a lot of people. Same thing here. All right, so the CPR level of a training are there's all kinds of great gatekeeper models out there, whether it's QPR 
or Safe Talk or Talk Save Lives, or the one that um, my colleagues and I helped develop, Working Minds, which is a gatekeeper training that is specifically designed for the workplace. So it has all kinds of tabletop exercises on it that are manager um, related and, and the complexity that workplace brings to this. Um, we also know just in the CPR model that that's not enough to create a safety net. We also need an advanced skill set. It's not like the ER surgeon, but it's something in between, and that's our paramedics and EMTs. So same thing here. We're realizing that in many workplaces, again, when there's lots of reluctance to reach out to mental health services, we need a fortified advanced peer support level where they're getting advanced training, things maybe like assist. Um, this is what the incredible international model of mates and construction was built around was this three-stage model um, and that they become the more trusted liaisons to getting people to services. Um, so we're starting to see this show up more and more, especially in some of those male dominated industries. So CPR for suicide prevention, we're uh, identifying people that might be suffering. Um, we're, we're being direct uh, in that effort and helping them uh, connect to a broader safety net. Um, so back to RK. So John, is, as I mentioned, and, and I started to put together a, a training program that he baked into his safety training program where people were regularly given working minds. Um, he now has a cadre of trainers within his company. So it has been baked into their training culture. Um, this is just a couple of years after we started this program. I wanted you to see what it looks like when people own this work and how they talk about it. The chances of whether or not someone will take their own life is connected to what they do for a living. The federal government's out with a first of a kind report looking at suicide rates by occupation. And it's confirmed what they suspected at a mechanical contracting firm in Denver. Our Kyle Dyer takes on a subject that could use more open discussion. Colonel, how are you doing? How are you? Good to see you. These hellos at the start of each day could not be more sincere. Good morning, how are you? How are you? Good, how are good, you? Good, good to see you. Job going good for you? As the RK team gets ready for another day on the construction site. How are you, sir? Good, how are good, you? Good, good to see you. Yeah. Tom Alvarez makes a point good to see check you. in with everyone. Good to see you. All right, guys, let's kind of wind up over here. And then he gathers up the RK crew for their toolbox talk. So we ask you that, you know, please keep your eyes and ears open. Alvarez is the safety manager at RK. Yes, safety as in not getting injured accidentally. But Alvarez is also determined to make sure his workers do not intentionally hurt themselves. We had an employee that was um, had worked for us and he'd been going through some issues at home. And he came in, started divvying out his tools to people. And, and you know, and then he went home one night and committed suicide. Why did RK decide to do this? Back then, Alvarez thought that colleague was changing his career. No one at RK recognized the warning signs of suicide. But that has changed over the last two years. We're changing our cultures. As RK faces the fact that construction is the number two industry when it comes to suicide among the workforce. Now everyone is aware of the symptoms of depression. If they see somebody not on, on, on the job, maybe 10 years ago, they would say, you know, they write them up and they get in the next morning for not showing up for work. We've changed our culture. It's like, now what's going on in your life? And, you know, I think that's just part of evolved, the evolution of construction too. How are you doing? Michelle Brown was approached by a coworker who was really struggling. Because of the awareness training, she knew exactly what to do. To be able to reach out to that person and to get them the help they needed and to be the individual that they could talk to, laugh with, cry with, um, it was incredible. And Brown says that man is now thriving. Kinning, RK's executive VP, says he also knows of workers who have turned away from the thought of suicide because of the support they received at work. So the training and the toolbox talks will continue. They have to. We're a family-owned business. You know, we care about people's families. We want them to come to work and be able to go home from work safe. With photojournalist Adam Vance, Kyle Dyer, 9 News. You'll be hearing more about suicide prevention in September, the month dedicated to raising awareness. It was about this time last year that Kyle told us a similar mental health support program that operates the Denver Fire okay. Department. So, uh, so John chances has gone on now to present on NPR and a number of other places and has been instrumental in working um, with uh, 
the National Action Alliance and other places to advance a construction industry association for suicide prevention, which now has hundreds of partners coming together and sharing best practices. That's the power of one leader to start rippling out a number of different efforts um, that has now become much broader than just RK. All right, downstream, um, we can do the upstream stuff, we can do the midstream stuff as best as we can, and sometimes we're still gonna find ourselves um, supporting people in crisis. And so some of the downstream pieces are really taking a look at what are our policies and resources around what we do at work when people are having a very, very difficult time. Um, one of the things that we coach our workplaces on is to go kick the tires of their mental health providers. Most often that's an employee assistance program. Now, usually what's happened is somebody checked a box that yes, we have a benefit for an EAP and no one knows anything about it. They don't know what it offers. They don't know if it's any good. They don't know if workers are using it. Um, and so I tell them to go check it out, call the EAP themselves, ask them some difficult questions about their preparedness to support people who are experiencing suicidal intensity. Um, I also encourage them to go into their communities to find um, their mental health community, uh, community mental health system, their crisis services locally, as well as addiction recovery. Um, and to be the one as the consumer of these resources to advocate on behalf of their workers for state of the art providing services. So asking them questions about how they've been trained, when were they last trained, what is their policy, should somebody come to them and, and identify that they are experiencing suicidal intensity, uh, and then to, to compare, compare different employee assistance programs and community resources to make sure they have a short list of highly vetted and personally connected uh, um, resources so that when somebody becomes in a crisis, they can do that warm handoff and with confidence. Um, and then finally, uh, in terms of crisis response, um, the last thing I'm going to cover is this resource. This is the Manager's Guide to Suicide Postvention in the Workplace, again, that came out of that workplace committee that's now housed under the American Association of Suicidology. Um, these are 10 action steps. Um, this is a crisis that impacts workplaces Unlike a robbery, unlike a natural disaster, you can't just um, drop in your usual crisis response protocol. There's lots of nuances here, including the exposure effect, um, privacy that families want to have, and the fact that it's a complicated grief and trauma response that can impact that inner circle of witnesses and friends and family for a long time a much longer time than the three days workplaces usually give people. Um, so this is a free downloadable PDF. It's in a million places on the internet. If you just search workplace postvention, it'll come up. Um, and it's important to add that into your uh, library of crisis resources because workplaces often, um, they don't respond well in this space. No one's taught them about how to respond in the first couple of days, in the first couple of weeks and months, and upwards of a year as we're having anniversary reactions. Uh, so this has also been evaluated. Um, and, uh, and then we wrote another chapter on how, uh, with uh, Jess Dolman Rainey and I wrote a chapter on a little bit more broadly, again, on the lived experience of people who had lost their loved ones to suicide at work uh, and the complexities that that brings. Um, the untold story is that many, many people lose their job after they've lost a close first degree person in their life to suicide because they just can't perform at the expectations that were held for them before. And so you can start to see the domino effect of this loss. And so we're trying again to mitigate that and to see if we can accommodate people in their trauma and grief after a suicide at work. So next steps for all of you is to go take the pledge at WorkplaceSuicidePrevention.com. Take the pledge to make suicide prevention a health and safety priority at work. Now, whether you're representing um, a company, an agency, a professional association, or you're just an individual who's passionate about this, there is a role for you in this effort. Once you take the pledge, you'll be enrolled through a registration process, and then you will have access to um, a badge program where, you know, just like the scouting, pro uh, scouting programs, you can start to earn badges by engaging in different activities related to suicide prevention in the workplace. Some of it is around um, needs and strengths assessment, 
Um, there are upstream activities, midstream and downstream activities, and there's even a pay it forward activity where you start to enroll others in this process. We're very excited. This will launch um, officially next week, uh, and um, we'll put out a lot of communication around suicide, National Suicide Prevention Week, um, and we hope you join us. So where do you begin? Um, you can begin in that process that I just mentioned to you by engaging with the national guidelines. Um, this is the order that we tend to recommend. Spend time listening. The usual pathway is that somebody dies by suicide that affects a workplace or a professional association and people get very upset and they immediately pull a training off the shelf and say, we must do something here. Let's do some training. And then that doesn't feel good for the people who missed the warning signs or have survivor guilt. You know, if you'd only said the thing, they would still be here kind of messages off of the takeaway. It doesn't go well. So spend time listening. I mentioned to you that with Juan, we had upwards of 18 months of listening before we officially did anything. And what that did is it bought trust. It had built in buy-in. We figured out who our storytellers and champions were. We gathered baseline data that we could then benchmark change against. Um, and it became much more strategic so that it was baked in. Um, usually the next step, because this is um, sometimes an unspoken part of emotional health at a workplace, is to get the leadership engagement. Make sure that they have a talking points, that they can lead the culture into a place that's far more caring and less fearful about this. Um, then it's really important to go do your resource audit. Make sure you've got resources in place that are well-trained and accessible and understand not just how to contain someone out of fear, but actually how to support and help people rebuild a life worth living. Um, training is also usually a, uh, a part of this. And again, just like CPR, it rolls out multiple points in time over a person's career, and there's different levels of um, uh, sophistication around these trainings, depending on whether or not you're a manager or in a position where you probably have high likelihood of in, in, in intervening. And then finally, a communications plan. How do we frame a message around suicide prevention in a way that increases people reaching out or um, is effective and not just fear-based? So all of these together, um, that's kind of an order uh, that people can think about where to begin and how to go forward. So here's Juan again. Now, remember I told you when he was doing his video, he was very apprehensive and he met me in the hallway and he said, just edit out my tears. This is the right thing to do, but I'm so scared. Um, fast forward, all right? We roll the training out to his thousand person department. He is now a peer supporter. He helps facilitate this training and he gets, he's at the lowest level of his hierarchy in his department. He was a basic firefighter. Um, so he had a lot to lose by being vulnerable with his, with his peers but he gets nothing but love and deep respect back from all of them for the bold steps he took in that effort. Um, he gets promoted. Uh, he is now a lieutenant. And he, uh, as you heard from the, from the video clip, um, Nine News, which is our major news network in Colorado, um, approached us and said, we wanna tell the story of the Denver Fire Department. And who raised his hand to be interviewed? Juan Vigil. Lieutenant Juan Vijo, um, and he went on statewide television talking about his story and the impact of helping one another and suicide prevention. And the night that aired, he texted me and he said, Sally, thank you so much for encouraging me to be courageous in this space. This is some of the most important work I have ever done. Um, now Juan presents on statewide and national conferences for firefighter behavioral health and suicide prevention, and he is amazing. Um, so please be bold. I look forward to um, learning more about your work and how you are advancing this cause and uh, hearing your stories of, of trials and tribulations as well as success. Thank you so much. Please, please, please stay connected.